What's going on you guys? It's your boy JT. If you guys are new to my channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below. If you guys aren't new to my channel, thank you guys so much for coming back. Today, I'm gonna to go ahead and talk about how to survive internal medicine as an international medical graduate. Stay tuned. If you're anything like me, you probably had no idea what was going on before you entered your internal medicine rotation. You probably had a lot of questions just like I did. So this video I specifically made for you, my experience, which may vary from your experience, but the overarching theme and the structure should go ahead and be around the same. After every single rotation, I'm gonna go ahead and make an informational video just like this one on how to survive X rotation. So after every rotation, I'm gonna make a new video talking about how to survive that specific rotation and what you need to do. Number one, how my medical school and how most medical schools will grade you on your rotation. Number two, what to expect your normal workflow day to day to be like in your internal medicine rotation. Number three, how you should study and how you should prepare for your shelf exam. Number four, what to expect on your shelf exam day. Number five, what things I enjoyed about the hospital that I rotated in and what things they could probably improve on. Stay to the end to see which hospital I was at, which hospital I'm currently at now, and what future plans I have for the future. As always, thanks so much for your love and support. Let's get right into the video. All right guys, how medical schools are gonna grade you for your internal medicine rotation. It kinda goes something like this. You will have the grades be either an honors pass, a high pass, a pass, or a fail. Keep in mind, your school will have their own requirements for you to get done during the rotation, and then the hospital's preceptors will have their own assignments for you to get done as well. Both the hospital preceptor and your school will grade you on three different categories. Number one, knowledge competency. Number two, clinical skills. And last but not least, number three, your professionalism. For your knowledge competency, your school will grade you on basically two categories. The evaluation of the knowledge from the hospital's preceptor that they thought you had, and the NBME shelf exam score. For my school, you needed to have at least a 79% or greater on your NBME internal medicine shelf in order to honor that specific rotation. For the clinical skills, your preceptor is going to evaluate your clinical skills on how you interact with the patient, and they're going to fill out something called a direct observation form, which they will send to the school. Last but not least, your professionalism. Basically, do you show up every day? How do you interact with the patient and how do you interact with the rest of the team? Keep in mind, in order to honors pass any rotation, you must have a honors pass in the MBME shelf and honors pass in at least one other category, whether that be clinical skills or your professionalism. In other words, if you get a honors pass in your professionalism and your clinical skills, but you only get a high pass in your NBME shelf or your knowledge competency, then that means you will only get a high pass for that shelf. All right, second thing I wanna to talk to you guys about is the daily workflow to expect in the hospital. Every hospital is different. For me, I was expected to be there no later than seven o'clock in the morning. We will start rounding around 9.30 with the attending, and around 12, 12.30, we'll go for lunch for a one hour lunch. After we're back from lunch, we will go ahead and finish up our notes, whether that be progress notes, discharge notes, or admitting notes. Also, once or twice a week, we would have lectures from one to two or didactics. Every hospital and every rotation is different. Some people will have more didactics, some people will have less didactics. I was also expected to be there six days a week. Some other hospitals only require you to be there five days a week. Keep that in mind. Another thing I wanna go over with the daily workflow as far as like the internal medicine experience is your presentation. Being able to present a patient in a thorough and a systematic manner will allow the attending physician to know what's going on with the patient as well as uh, let you know that you're doing a good job. For the most part, the attending only really cares about two things. Number one, the patient's assessment. What's their assessment? What do you think is going on with this patient? And secondly, the plan. What's the plan for this patient? 
what problems does he have and what are we gonna do to fix him and why is he still here or is she still here? I'm gonna share with you guys exactly how you should present a patient with this template. You'll be able to modify it for each individual hospital because each individual hospital and their residents will want you to present a different way. But if you start this way, they'll be able to take away a couple things, but they definitely won't add something to it. So what am I talking about? Let's just go ahead and give you an example. This is exactly how you should present when you are starting rounds with your attending physician in the morning. Let's say you have a patient that was assigned to you who had heart failure. They came in for chest pain. You did all this work up, you go and assess the patient, do a physical exam on them, you come back, you look at their labs, what's going on with them, you look at their imaging, what was the diagnostic criteria, you come up with your assessment, you come up with your plan, and this is how you're going to present this patient to the attending. Number one, the intro, one-liner. Mr. Smith is a 65-year-old male who came in with chest pain one day ago. Number two, overnight events. Explain what happened overnight, if there was anything that was significant. Anything like abnormal telemonitoring, uh, any symptoms that we should know about, things like that. No acute events overnight, nothing significant on tele. Number three, the subjective. What did the patient say when you went and talked to that patient in the morning? For example, subjectively today, Mr. Smith is feeling well. He has a slight headache around five out of 10. It doesn't really radiate. It's relieved by Tylenol. He's also complaining of shortness of breath when he goes up to go to the bathroom. The shortness of breath is relieved by rest. Other than that, there's no significant complaints. Fourthly, the vital signs. Some attendings want you to list off every single vital sign. Every attending will be different. They'll let you know, hey, I only need the blood pressure or I only need this or only tell me the vital signs if they're significant. For example, respiratory rate is about 16 and heart rate is 60 beats per minute. Fifthly, you wanna go ahead and track this input and this output. This is more important for patients that had swelling of the legs that have a lot of edema. For example, for his eyes and nose today, he still looks volume up to me. According to his chart, he did void about one total liter yesterday. However, he's been intaking more fluids than output. Overall, he is up two liters. The next thing is going to be your physical exam. What did you find that was significant? Physical exam, largely unchanged from yesterday. Peripheral edema, two plus on the lower limbs, up to the knee. Cardiopulmonary exam, relatively benign. Rate was slightly tacky. No murmurs, no thrills. There still seems to be some crackles bilaterally at the lower lung bases. Otherwise, no wheezing, no ronchi. The rest of the physical exam was largely benign. Next, you're gonna go into your labs. These are specific values that you need to give that are important for the patient. For example, for his labs, relatively unremarkable, except for a white count of 14. For his chemistry, also unremarkable, except for a sodium of 149 and glucose of 150 fasting. Repeat troponin is less than 0.1. Next up is the imaging any new imaging that is relevant to the patient. For example, TTE did come back this morning showing injection fraction of 35 to 40%, showing mildly enlarged left ventricle cavity size, as well as severe left atrial dilation. All right, next up is the assessment. This is the money maker. This is where the attending wants to know your knowledge of how well you know the patient. It should include the patient, their past medical history, why they are there, what you did so far, any new imaging, and what's the status of this patient currently. For example, Mr. Smith is a 65-year-old male with a past medical history of type 2 diabetes and hypertension. He presented to the emergency department one day ago for a sudden onset of chest pain and shortness of breath. Initially worked up for possible MI, however, after negative workup and positive TTE, found to have a new onset of acute heart failure exacerbation Currently, the patient is hemodynamically stable and on two liters of oxygen nasal cannula. That was the assessment. It should be two, maybe three sentences max, no more. Next up is the plan. The plan should include the diagnosis, what you did to prove or deny that certain diagnosis, other possible differentials that still might be on the table, and what you're going to do for that person for that specific problem. Here's an example. 
For his first problem, I have a new onset of heart failure. From his initial presentation, past medical history of hypertension, diabetes, insurance of breath, and positive TTE, I have reason to believe the chest pain was caused by heart failure exacerbation, likely in the setting of medication non-adherence and overall deconditioning. Other differentials include NSTEMI, due to initial troponin being positive and acute chest pain, however, less likely due to the second and third repeat troponin levels being negative. What I want to do for this patient is to start goal-directed medical therapy, restart his home aspirin 81 milligrams, restart home lisinopril, hold the metformin, start on Lantus 20 units once daily along with low dose lighting scale, continue Lasix 20 per IV once, and consider adding Bumex 2.5 milligrams per IV because this patient seems volume up to me. Other things that you would do as a medical student in the internal medicine rotation is call pharmacies just to make sure that they are taking the medications that they say they are taking. Call family members in order to let them know, hey, how's the patient doing, what they are up to, as well as any plans for the day. Other things that you might be able to assist in would be central lines, peripheral lines, as well as bedside POCUS, which is basically point of care ultrasound and things like that. Every single hospital is a little bit different. You'll have to get used to your hospital. All right, next I wanna talk about how you should prepare and how I prepared for my internal medicine shelf. So basically my study life throughout the week looks something along the lines of this. I would get home around 3.30, get ready for the gym, go to the gym. I would be back home around 5.30 and I would do one hour of online med ed video lectures. And I like online med ed because they have literally everything you need to know for your step exam, as well as for your shelf exam. They have all the videos broken up into shelf subjects. For example, they have a nice little column for clinical medicine and internal medicines right there. They have a bunch of videos ranging from every single organ system that you can think of. So I would watch about two, maybe three videos a day, which should sum up about an hour. I would do the questions associated with those videos and I would make any Anki cards associated with those videos. Next, I would do 20 questions, 20 to 30 questions of UWorld every single day after I was done watching the online meta videos. So I would do my UWorld, I would usually do it timed, and then I would go ahead and review all my questions that I would, I would get right or I would even get wrong. And then the next day, I would do my Anki and I would do that same pattern every single day for like six days a week. I would like to take a rest day once a week just to like, you know, settle in, take time for myself because one thing you will notice, especially for me, internal medicine being a 12 week rotation, you would get burnt out very quickly. So I encourage you just to make time for yourself at least once a week. But if you do that, same thing, that's a great way to start. One hour of online med ed every single day, one hour of view world every single day. And if you can get to Anki, great. And you would do that for about six days a week. And once you get towards closer to your shelf exam, I would say two weeks out, I would start taking the free, not the free, but the paid MBMEs online. There's certain uh, uh, expired or offline MBMEs for the subject of internal medicine out there, but I just paid for mine just because I like the software and I wanna get used to it anyways. And it, they give you like a really nice breakdown of things that you missed and didn't miss. My recommendation is to get at least a 65 to a 68% twice in order to sit for the real MBME shelf. The way they grade it, it's a little weird. It's from one to 30 and one being 0%, 30 being 100%. I would go around 18, 19, 20. I would wanna get that score after taking an MBME practice exam and you should be set for test day. Speaking about test day, you want to go ahead and schedule your MBME shelf exam early. You'll get, a, you'll get your testing permit from your school at whatever point. With that testing permit, you'll go to the ProMetric website, schedule your exam and show up to the exam and during the exam, you're going to have two hours and 45 sec, uh, you're gonna have two hours and 45 minutes to take the entire exam. So 110 questions for two hours and 45 minutes. That's 90 seconds for each question. You don't have a scheduled break. 
That's something very important that you need to know. So you don't have a scheduled break and it's, the clock is just continually running. Yes, you can go to the, the restroom, but the clock will just be running. For me, the MBME uh, internal medicine shelf, it felt fair. So they're not trying to trick you. They're not trying to do anything crazy. So that's what you need to know for your internal medicine shelf when it comes to exam day. Lastly, my overall experience, it was great. I really enjoy interaction with patients. I interact calling patients' families to let them know how they're doing. And I also enjoy being able to have good camaraderie with the residents. Every single week, the residents would switch when it comes to uh, the team. And I would get a new group of residents every single week. So I got to know pretty much every single new resident that was at that program. I really liked being able to interact with the patients and I like to present on my patients. It was a little nerve wracking in the beginning, but I feel like overall my, my overall experience at a specific hospital was really good. One thing I wasn't a big fan of was having to work six days a week. And that was a little daunting at first, but it was doable. So for, so for 12 weeks, I had to get up every single day at 5.50, be at the hospital by 6.45 or whatever, and uh, do that for 12 weeks. But you got used to it, but Every once in a while, you'll get a three-day weekend. It's called a golden weekend. Um, or you'll get a two-day weekend, excuse me. You'll get a two-day weekend every once in a while. Uh, I also liked the food vouchers that they gave us. So we had a food card and we had a uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner paid for, which is like super awesome. Um, so that was pretty much my overall experience. And um, oh yes, we also had free parking, which is really cool. So if you made it to the end of the video, I'm gonna let you guys know where I was at for my internal medicine shelf and where I am now and where I plan to go. For my internal medicine uh, rotation, I was in Oakland, California for 12 weeks in a hospital called Highland Hospital. And it was great. Everyone there was super friendly, really welcoming, and I highly recommend if anyone's trying, thinking about doing any sub-internships uh, for their fourth year. Where I'm at now, I'm currently at San Joaquin uh, hospital in Stockton, California. I don't technically live in Stockton, California, but it's about a nine hour, uh, nine minute drive for me. So it's not that bad. And I'm doing my family medicine uh, rotation right now. And I'm doing the rest of my rotations at San Joaquin until December. So, so with this new series, I plan to put out a new video after every single rotation. So after this family medicine rotation, I'll go ahead and say how to survive family medicine. So I'll do that with every single rotation so that you guys can know what to expect going into your rotation. All right, guys, that's all I have for you today. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate all the love and support. And if you guys don't follow me already on Instagram, go ahead and follow me, Julian Solo Torres. For any questions that you have, that's the best way to get a hold of me. And I'll go ahead and respond as quickly as I can. I appreciate all the love and support. I've already gotten so many um, you know, DMs and I love working with students and answering any questions that they have about, you know, a Caribbean medical school or rotations, uh, ask away. So that's all I have for you guys today. I really appreciate all the love and support until next time. Much love. Peace out.